Let's talk about Freedom Day. It was going to be yesterday, of course, Midsummer's Day. That was cancelled. <laughs> uh, now we're told it's going to be July the 19th. Uh, but what does it mean? Uh, we hear freedom. You get your freedom back. Well, apparently uh, that will entail uh, COVID passes to get into uh, sports events and to festivals. Also, they're talking about COVID passports to get into pubs to allow us to be able to go to pubs, even if the crisis gets worse in the winter and even restaurants. This sounds like vaccine passports to me. How are we being persuaded uh, that vaccine passports are the way forward? And in what way are these medical documents commensurate with any kind of freedom. Uh, let's talk to the editor of Spiked Online and social commentator Brendan O'Neill. Good evening, Brendan. Hi, Kevin. Uh, yes, uh, you got the gist of that. Uh, we're being told uh, that Freedom Day will come along on July the 19th. Uh, we've heard this before, but let's give the government the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but in the same breath almost, uh, they've changed the narrative. Not so long ago, it was like, well, we don't like the idea of vaccine passports. Uh, now uh, they're saying, in order to facilitate a sizzling summer of sport, you will be able to go and watch your favourite football teams and cricket teams, but you'll have to have vaccine papers. Uh, same for, we, we, even if there's a surge in COVID through the winter, you will still be able to go to pubs, we hope, by producing your medical papers. This isn't freedom, is it? Absolutely not. They're moving the goalposts all the time. One minute they're saying we won't have COVID passports, then they're saying, well, we might need them. One minute they're saying we're going to open uh, in June, and the next we're going to open in July. I mean, they're just changing the story all the time. And I think people are finding it incredibly frustrating. It's like we live in this kind of purgatory at the moment. We don't know if we're coming or going. And I think the government underestimates how serious COVID passports would be and, and how much they would radically change this society for the worse. You know, it would basically make us a papers please society where you could be asked to produce your papers for the most mundane of activities, you know, walking into the street, walking into a pub, walking into a theatre. That's not the kind of society we want to become. I think it's alarming that people like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, who've written for years and years about the importance of freedom and the, the, the wrongness of the nanny state and why we're all sick and tired of the Blairites and everyone else uh, wagging their fingers at us, those two critics of authoritarianism are now thinking about introducing unprecedented forms of authoritarianism in this country, and that should worry everyone. And Michael Gove is actually in charge of a review of uh, what they call, they keep changing the name, you know, at one point we were calling them vaccine passports, uh, then they changed the name to health passes, uh, I think the current uh, vogue is for COVID passes, you know, they take, it, they take out the word passport because then people start thinking of vaccine passports, but he is undergoing a review of our whole approach to this, and you know what that means. He's going to come out in favour of them. And it's, it is sort of sinister the way they change the narrative and the newspapers tend to fall for it. So, so at one point, as I say, we were all going, no vaccine passports. Very, thank you very much. Uh, this week, the headlines are literally I did see that headline. It was uh, uh, Covid passports for a sizzling summer of sport. You know, they're, they're, I mean they're turning it into something positive and it's not. It's not positive at all. And I can feel our freedom slipping away. I mean, you know, people argued over whether it was necessary to restrict our liberties during the pandemic itself, especially in the first lockdown. There was a lot of healthy disagreement about whether that lockdown was necessary. Some people thought it was the right thing to do. A minority of people thought it was the wrong thing to do. All of those discussions were all good, interesting and important that we had them out. But what's happening now is something very different, because what's happening now is we are one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. And we were told that once we were vaccinated, we could get our freedoms back. In fact, once the vulnerable were vaccinated, we would get our freedoms back. We're very well vaccinated. We have beaten back the worst of the virus, although we've always got to be vigilant, of course. We seem to have broken the link between infection and death. You know, uh, cases are rising at the moment, but hospitalizations and deaths are still very low. And yet we're still being told that we might have to enter this whole new era of authoritarianism, of COVID passports, of 
restricting freedom whenever there's another outbreak of COVID-19. So we're heading into a whole new era. And that's the thing people have got to be aware of and got to be willing to push back against because we can't let this virus utterly undermine British freedoms and take us into a new kind of authoritarianism that just doesn't sit well with most people. Well, the fabulous uh, government plan to allow us to go to pubs and restaurants uh, in the winter, even if there's, you know, a fifth or a fourth or a tenth wave or whatever they're calling it now. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm bored with waves. Uh, but uh, th this is uh, that uh, your vaccine passport, sorry, your COVID pass, whatever the current euphemism is, uh, will be uh, allied to your NHS app. In other words, they're telling you you've got to get an NHS app to go down the boozer. Uh, now, as things stand, you don't have to get an NHS app at all. Uh, but uh, by telling us if you fancy a pint down the pub, you better get your NHS app. Again, we step further away from our world of freedom, don't we? We absolutely do. And, you know, another worrying thing about all of this is that the government is casting aspersions on the vaccination programme. You know, do vaccines work or not? Uh, you know, do we have a herd immunity or not? Uh, those were the things that we were told were very important. And now we're being told, despite the fact that the majority of people in this country have got herd immunity, you know, whether through vaccination or having been ill with the virus, despite that fact, we still have to be uber cautious. We still have to restrict freedom and we have to countenance the possibility of future lockdowns, including in winter. You know, ministers are already raising the possibility of another lockdown in winter when, of course, there will probably be an outbreak of COVID-19, just like there is an outbreak of flu every winter as well. The question we have to ask ourselves is it really the government's job to stop people from getting ill? I don't think it is. <laughs> no. You know, thousands of people die every year from flu. We don't lock down society because we we recognised previously that freedom is incredibly important. So locking down society every time there's an outbreak of COVID-19, in my mind, would be completely unacceptable. And it really would redefine the relationship between the individual and the society he lives in. And that deserves a lot of consideration and, in my view, a lot of protest as well. The way uh, this government latches on to any excuse to uh, increase or maintain the alarm we all feel about coronavirus, I said we all feel, to be honest with you, I'm bored with it. But uh, I've just literally just heard on the news that the uh, India has announced uh, a potentially worrying new variant after 24 cases were discovered in three separate states in India. This is getting ridiculous, is it not? Completely ridiculous. Uh, you know, the fact is there are always going to be new variants. That's what happens with viruses. You know, Theresa May, of all people, made a very sensible comment in the House of Commons the other day where she said, if we are going to stop travel around the world until there are no new variants, then we will never travel around the world again. And if we are going to say that we can't open up until people stop dying from COVID-19, then we will never open up again. We've got to be grown up about this. We've got to realize that COVID-19 has joined the family of human illnesses. And thankfully, through human and scientific endeavor, we have tamed it to a large extent. We've made sure that it doesn't kill as many people in the future as it has done over the past year. So we've very successfully beaten it back, but it is going to be part of our lives for the rest of time. And we have got to accept that. The unwillingness of government officials to accept that truth and to encourage people to live with that reality, that's really reckless because what they're essentially saying is, our job in government is to protect you from every kind of risk. And that really does open up the door to an endless kind of authoritarianism where they could shut down society at the click of their fingers if they think there's a risk around the corner. Uh, the thing is, the government's also sort of, you're quite right, it seems to uh, have taken on the role of uh, stopping us all getting even a little ill. Uh, but it's also uh, rather successfully turned itself into the anti-death league in so far as the numbers of fatalities now from COVID are infinitesimal. And yet this drama, this saga continues. Uh, what is going on in the mind of Boris and Sage and his cabinet? I would love to know, you know, the, according to the ONS, 
Um, COVID is currently the 24th leading cause of death in this country. So it's way down the list. And yet the whole of society is being reorganized around COVID-19. It makes no sense. And I think it is part of this, you, you know, you say they're the anti-death league. We do have, we have arrived at a situation where the government thinks it can suspend economic life, suspend every single liberty, force people potentially to stay in their homes or to stay in their local areas or to stay in the country if there is any possibility that they will get ill and die. We have never had that situation before. We've always accepted that life is uh, life comes with risk. You risk having an accident, you risk getting sick, you risk being hurt in a relationship. Life is full of risk and we recognize that the, those risks are a price worth paying for living in a free society, for living in an open society where people can mingle and can do what they want. But that's all changing. We're now saying essentially that it is, it, that's not an acceptable price to pay and no level of risk is worth it. So we really do need to have a serious discussion about risk, a serious discussion about the role of government and, and why it should be more limited than it currently is, and a serious discussion about the importance of everyday freedom. And until we do that, I fear that we're going to stagger from one lockdown to another. Uh, my definition of freedom is uh, walking down the street, seeing a pub, fancying a pint, walking in, going to the bar, ordering a pint, drinking it while standing there, and then maybe leaving the pub, no questions asked. That's freedom. If we don't get that, that is not traditional British freedom. I can't let you go, Brendan, without uh, asking you about today's report by the Education Select Committee at Parliament uh, about uh, uh, white uh, working class kids who turn out to be uh, the people who have been almost abandoned by a generation of right on school teachers who've been filling their minds with the concept of white privilege. These kids are at the bottom of the league table when it comes to educational standards. Only 16% of them are going to university. Uh, they are the worst casualties of a, an education system that uh, teaches kids about unconscious bias, uh, critical race theory and white privilege. Something's gone badly wrong here, hasn't it? It absolutely has. And I think this report has shattered the myth of white privilege. The idea of white privilege is a complete nonsense. The majority of white people are working class. They are not privileged. They struggle to make ends meet. And as this report makes clear, white working class kids are doing worse in school than every other social group. So something is going on here. And I think it's down to the fact that the, the woke elites who run the education system and who run a lot of politics as well, they have a very disdainful attitude towards white working class communities. They see them as feckless and xenophobic. Brexiteers, and yeah. <laughs> Brexiteers, flag wavers, idiots, you know, all the nonsense that they pile on these people, which has really had a detrimental impact on those communities' sense of self and on young members of those communities and their desire to move forward through education and into the world of work. So that contempt, that culture war against white working class communities has had a devastating impact. And we've got to scrap the talk of white privilege and treat white working class kids with the same respect that every other kid in this country deserves. Brendan, keep on doing what you do. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure to talk. Brendan O'Neill from Spiked Online there. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and this is Talk Radio.